You're about to watch my debate with Tucker Carlson at Politicon 2018. If you want to support the home of progressives, TYT, become a member today by clicking the link in the description box below. I think what we need in America today is a productive exchange of ideas in such a polarized time, and that's why we're convening this discussion tonight. So let's bring them out first. Make some noise for the founder and host of the Young Turks, Cenk Uygur. Thank you. I love Politicon. <laughs> All right, and please also welcome the host of Tucker Carlson tonight on Fox News, Tucker Carlson. I, I, I told our panelists backstage, I think Politicon is revved up. How about you? What do you think about that? Okay, so just a quick note about format here. Uh, what we want to do uh, is have an open dialogue uh, to focus on the substance, uh, to talk about some of the major issues facing our country right now. And, uh, and my role is going to be to help them get from topic to topic, but I really want you guys to go back and forth. I think that will be most interesting uh, for the audience. And my one request on behalf of the audience is that we don't talk over each other, uh, we listen to each other, uh, so that way uh, the audience can hear what you're saying. So let's start with an issue that's in the news right now that I think gets to some of the core uh, challenges in our country. Uh, and that is on the topic of immigration and the group of migrants who are coming uh, to the U.S. border. About 5,000 uh, migrants are uh, on their way, and we've heard uh, President Trump uh, make statements saying that they will not be allowed in. Obviously, it's a major uh, humanitarian uh, crisis, and so I want to start with Tucker. You know, how do we address this situation of people who are definitely suffering a lot uh, but also don't have visas to come in? How do we start to approach this situation? Well, I mean, it, it, you have to create a hierarchy of imperatives. First of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here and in a room full of people who don't live in Washington with someone smart to talk to. And um, I'm going to really try to be as sort of civil and polite as I can. And maybe my mind will be changed because in this world, things are changing so fast. Why wouldn't your mind change? Um, so maybe you can change my mind. I would say on the question of this group of migrants coming north, the one that came three months ago coming north, the 22 million who are currently living here uh, illegally. It's all sort of species of the same question, which is the first question. I mean, there are many questions, and one of them is, what do you, you know, how do you help other people? And a lot of smart people run NGOs are thinking about that in Washington, and some are doing a good job, others are not. But the main question the U.S. government has to answer is how do we enforce our laws voted on democratically by our Congress? And how do we protect our people, the people to whom we have really the only duty that we have, right? I mean, the purpose of the government is to protect you and to help you. And again, I, you know, I'm a Christian, and I, I think I'm a person of not particularly good faith, but decent faith, okay? So I'm always sort of for helping people, but, that, but the government's job is to represent the voters and enforce the laws that they sent their representatives to Washington to pass, and that's kind of all their job is, actually. So our law says that you need permission to come into this country, and that is the law of every country that is a country. And without that, you're sort of not a country. So I mean, you could ask the obvious question, which is, you know, there are an awful lot of poor people around the world. Does everyone have a right to come here and go on Medicaid? I don't know. I mean, if you think so, let's you know, speak slowly so I can understand, and let's talk it through. And tell me why. Where does that obligation come from exactly? Is it written in the Constitution? Is it in the Bible? What, you know, what exactly are you saying? But you're not hearing that. Instead, you're hearing an awful lot of the kind of moral bullying that has come 
to characterize all of our political conversations where the person you're debating, in this case I'm debating, begins with the presumption of I'm a better person than you. I care more deeply for these people than you do, and if you were a good person, you would agree with me. Well, I mean, that's a theological debate. And I, you know, I, I reserve a huge part of Sundays for those. But that's not really a public policy debate. There isn't much of a public policy debate here. Our laws are as they are, and if you want to change them, send representatives to Washington to do that, and maybe we're about to see that happen. But there's a massive cost to any government saying, because of political pressure, temporary political pressure, we're going to ignore our own laws. Then well, why can't I ignore the law? I pay way more taxes than I feel like paying. I, there are all kinds of things that I would like to ignore. Anyway, so I'm not really sure what the debate is. To, I mean, to be totally blunt with you, other than the virtue debate, which is not interesting, Let's go to Jenk here. Yeah. All right, so let's break it down. Um, and backstage, uh, we had far too much agreement, so let's break that up. Um, so first of all, on the caravan, uh, I, I feel like Fox News, um, from time to time, touches on it, but overall misleads. And I'll tell you why, Tucker. Uh, it makes it sound like the caravan's going to come in and bust through a gate of some sort and then go ravaging in the country. Well, the reality is the reason they're in a caravan is because they're seeking asylum. So if they wanted to sneak into the country, they wouldn't do it in a giant caravan. So, and, and so when you're talking about the laws, there are also laws in place uh, on how to seek asylum. And that is exactly what they're following. So that caravan actually, in a way, uh, should be celebrated because they are not going to cross the border illegally. They are going to go to a port where you ask for asylum. Now, now, Donald Trump is suggesting that we should reject asylum out of hand without talking to people. Now, that is not the law, and that is not the American way. And so, and, and Tucker, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. I, it's, I'm not trying to compare you or Fox News or anybody to this. I'm just giving an extreme example of what happens when you uh, don't listen to people. So we've done that in the past. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, Jews came here on boats asking for asylum, and we sent them back. And uh, one particular ship uh, that came to Florida that was sent back, 25% of those people uh, were murdered in a concentration camp. And God knows what happened to the other 75%. There's sometimes a good reason to hear them out. And what we're asking for is something very simple, and that is within the law, hear them out. It's not too much to ask for. So I would, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll let the whole Nazi reference go on, on, on remarks upon. But I would say, look, if I have one criticism of Americans is they haven't traveled enough. And one, I know you have traveled a lot. And one thing you learn when you travel is there are a lot of really hurting parts of the world. So nothing that is happening in Guatemala right now, or Honduras, or Salvador, is unique to those countries, or even to Central America, Latin America, or even this hemisphere. That kind of thing is happening all over the world, where for a bunch of different reasons, most of them political, millions upon millions, billions in fact, of people are suffering and desperate. And of course, my heart goes out to all of them. The question is, what duty does the US government have to them? And I would argue it doesn't have a duty to them, okay? It has a duty to its own people. Now that's not, again, I think people of goodwill have a lot they can do to help those people, okay? I do think that. But the government is something very different. And I would also argue that there is a cost to this, a cost that the left used to recognize. It was once obvious. So I grew up in this state in Southern California, and Cesar Chavez was a hero. I mean, we have a day in California dedicated to his memory. And Cesar Chavez, among many other things, he was a, a serious leftist, an economic leftist, he was a socialist. But among many other things, he was passionately, in fact, violently anti-immigration. Why? Because he was anti-Mexican? I mean, you know, he was of Mexican descent, of course not. Because he led a labor union. And he understood that supply and demand is a real thing. And if you have an overabundance of anything, its value falls. That's why sand is cheap. So if you let people in from poor countries willing to work for less, your wages fall, particularly at the bottom end, among your most vulnerable. This was axiomatic on the left for 100 years. All of our anti-immigration laws were the result of lobbying from organized labor, from Democrats, because they had a responsibility to their people. And Republicans' management, the people who owned the fruit companies who hired the pickers, were totally for unrestrained 
immigration, legal and illegal, because it made their labor costs lower. So I would only say, and it's a more complicated question than just this, but this is a huge part of it. It's one of the reasons that wages have stalled. And for some categories of people, high school educated people, they've gone down over the last 30 years. Like, this is a real thing. And the last thing I'll say is, you, if you bring this up, everyone wants to make a race question out of it. You don't like them because they're different. From, oh, please. There's nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what kind of country you want to live in. Do you want to live in a country where people with very little economic power have even less? Then open the doors, and that's what you'll get. All right, so a, lo a, a lot to respond to there. So let, let's break it down one by one. First of all, uh, this is a country, and this is not a cliche, it's true, it's a t country made of immigrants. Uh, I'm an immigrant, I, uh, and I came in in a legal way. So, and, and I, and I want to support that, and I, want, and I think that that's not a matter of doing me a favor, it's not a matter of doing someone from Honduras a favor, it's a matter of what is best for the country. And I think immigrants have built this country, whether they were Italian, Irish, Chinese, Jewish, and Mexican, yes, they have built this country. And, and so I think that is a great value to the country. In fact, there is demagoguery about how immigrants keep taking from us, but the reality is, and every study shows this, since a lot of the undocumented immigrants pay into Social Security and Medicare as part of the payroll taxes, but never get it out, they actually put more taxes into the system than they take out of the system. And, and so if we're talking about what is the, the correct uh, policy to have, so there is a discussion about reform in, in uh, Congress that's gone nowhere, but the idea there was to take indentured servitude and double it. And then if you work here for 14 years, if you're undocumented, you could have a pathway to citizenship. Now the right wing said, that's too lenient. I don't know if they want three times indentured servitude, I don't know. But my answer is, look, can we at least go back to indentured servitude? So for seven years, they work and, and they pay their dues. Have they not done enough and shown enough to become US citizens? That means they are adding to our country, they are not taking away from our country. So that is a proposal that I believe in and that I will fight for. And, and immigrants are, are net positive in almost every way imaginable, and, and also demagoguery on the issue of criminality. The reality is native-born Americans, unfortunately, commit crime at over twice the rate of undocumented immigrants. So if we're gonna kick anyone out, it would be us, well not me because I wasn't born here, but, um, but of course we're not going to do that either because we all work together and, and we can win together. Now in terms of wages, Tucker is absolutely right that wages have been stagnant and they have been stagnant since about 1978. Productivity has not, the American worker has been wonderfully productive. It has gone up by over 200% since that time. But if you're looking to see who took your wages, don't look down, look up. The guy, just last thought here, the guy who walked in at, and crossed the border without a penny to his name did not somehow rig the rules. No, the person who rigged the rules are the ones that are paying the politicians. Yes. Campaign contributions are unadulterated bribery. They're absolutely, positively bribery, and they are done to maintain power for the economic elite. And that is what's keeping your wages stagnant. Well, I, I kind of, let me just say, I kind of agree with some of that, unexpectedly, but I, th I think you're right. I mean, I, I don't blame really immigrants for anything. As people, the policies are not formulated by them. The question is who benefits from our current system, which is clearly totally dysfunctional. If you have 20 million or 22 million, north of 20 million people without papers in your country, it's clearly not working. So the question is who's benefiting from that? And there's an entire political party that hopes to sort of have a new voter base on the basis of those people. And you have, that's true, as you know. And I don't think anyone's hiding it, by the way. And if you're for that party, I mean, I guess you're for that. And then there are also, and I think you alluded to this, a lot of employers who are benefiting from that. But, and, and by the way, you're also right that a lot of immigrants are in fact exploited. I mean, we've created an entire surf class to serve the day-to-day -day needs of the rich. Like, that's just true. And by the way, if you want to see the most intense opponents of changing or fixing our immigration system, talk to like some of your rich people in my neighborhood. 
And it's like, well, who's going to walk the dogs while I'm at SoulCycle? Like, they, I'm serious. And, and they have a, I mean, we're doing that. And, it, and most people are not benefiting. Only a small number is benefiting. So, look, I, I would agree with a lot of what you said, or certainly the tenor of what you said. It's not their fault. But it does get to a core question, which is, do you, as a U.S. citizen, have the right to have any voice at all in who comes in? Because demographics is like one of the key questions. Who lives here? Again, not a racial question. It's a substantive factual question. And I don't think you'll find many people in this country who are opposed to immigration. We have more immigrants, aggregate, you know, total immigrants, than any country's ever had in peacetime, ever. Okay? And you don't have riots in the streets. You don't have lunatics. Lots of other countries do. South Africa right now killing Zimbabweans because they're mad about unchecked immigration. I get it. We don't have that. We like immigrants. The question is, are we allowed to make the decision? It's our country. And in that hour, I would include lots of naturalized immigrants, including you. We all have a right to decide. And so to say it's anti immigrant look, I'm for dinner parties. I have lots of dinner parties. I love inviting 12 people over to my house and having dinner. If you decided who they were or said you're not allowed to decide who the 12 people are, that wouldn't be a dinner party, would it? It would be an invasion or something. It would be something I'm very much against. So the question is, where is the economic debate? I mean, and what I appreciated about your response was you, and I disagree with your numbers, but at least you marshaled them. Like, what is the economic effect of this? I grew up in this state. When I grew up here, it was the richest out of 50. It had the best schools out of 50. It had the most vibrant middle class out of 50. It now has, it's 48th for schools. It has more poor people than any state. Its infrastructure is crumbling and the middle class is living in Boise. So how did that happen? There are lots of reasons it happened, but the truth is economics is not magic. Importing millions of poor people, every one of them a good person, I'm willing to assume, doesn't make you richer. So the rest of us have a right to have that conversation. That's all I'm saying. Don't shut it down with racist, please. But Tucker, let, let me follow up on that. So, so I, I, I think I know why California schools are uh, disastrous because of the propositions that, uh, may, that did not allow us to invest in the schools. And, uh, and now the private schools have, have created a way to have rich people bring their kids to one school and then make sure they don't pay for the other. Uh, but, but I want to follow up on what you said, because look, on the Statue of Liberty, it says, give me your tired, your poor, uh, your masses, etc. And And so when the Irish were first coming in, they were dirt poor. They were uh, escaping a famine. The Italians, dirt poor. The Jews, dirt poor. Yeah. Under your logic, would we not have kept them out? Well, no, because this is a sit hold on. This is a si this is a situational. Before you applaud too vigorously, I can win you. Listen, <laughs> it's a situa it's a situational decision. So when we had the largest wave up until recently of immigration into this country, at the beginning of the last century, that was the industrialization period in this country. So who manned the factories? Who made the shoes? Who wove the textiles? Immigrants did. There was a massive need for labor, and we responded by importing huge amounts of labor. We did until 1924, in which case Americans, including recent naturalized immigrants, looked around and was like, you know what? We've had a lot of change. Change creates volatility in your society. We had a lot of drama, the progressive movement, the wobblies. We had a lot going on in this country. We were like, you know what? We're shutting it down. And we shut it down from 1924 to 1965, not because we're racist, but because we made the decision. Now what we're looking at, and this is what drives me maybe craziest, is a landscape totally transformed by technology, by automation. This is not secret knowledge. Look it up. One of the reasons that people are so powerless, they felt they had to vote for Donald Trump, is because the value of labor is in steep decline. Immigration's part of it. Technology, I would argue, is probably even a bigger part of it. Huge sectors of the entire economy are about to be replaced by machines. This will mean massive internal displacement of workers who will have even less power than they do now. Into that, you're throwing a huge number of new people. And my only question is, OK, what are they going to do in a world where a lot of the jobs now occupied by people will be occupied by machines? And the answer I get is, shut up, racist. OK, fine. That's not actually an answer. And we have an obligation, I think, if those in my business like, you know, try to like, convince people or whatever, to raise the question. And I can't get anybody on either side to take it seriously at all. 
And that's when I began to conclude that they're totally reckless. They don't know what they're doing, almost any of them. They're lying about it. And they're wrecking the country because that is a very obvious chain of events that's going to take place. And nobody says it. But, So one more follow-up there, at least, Tucker. So um, look, in terms of do we need the immigrants now and what cycle are we in history in, in America, well, a couple of southern states took away, uh, did some raids, took away uh, some undocumented immigrants, and then they panicked because nobody came and took the jobs, whether it was farming or warehouses and factories, et cetera. And so then they had to change the law and say, okay, never mind, they can come back in. So that happened a couple of years ago, and we've seen that. So, Obviously, the, and there's actually a great number of examples of that in the country, obviously there is some need for those workers. So when I see those Latin American workers that have come in, I see the same faces uh, as the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and all the others that came in very poor, but that made this country much, much richer in the end. And so when, Tucker, when you say the word demographics, I think that is what makes people go, hmm. What does that mean? And so I genuinely want to ask you about that. So you, you did a story about Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and you were worried that the demographics of that town was changing. Why? Why are you worried about it? Because change is really hard. I mean, look at, and I'll address the first part, I think, more interesting part of what you just said in just a second. But to the demographic question, let me just say out front, I don't ever speak in dog whistles because I can say whatever I want, and I always do. So I, so I appreciate the question because I'm often attacked on the basis of, you know, maybe something, and it, it's probably my fault for not explaining whatever it was fully, but let me just say, nothing is in code, okay? <laughs> it's all right out there. And my core concern is change and the pace of change because I don't think that people are hardwired for it. And so you have a group, Homo sapiens, that have lived a certain way for only like 10,000 years, not a big deal, hand-to-mouth agrarian society, boom, the machine age happens with the invention of the steam engine, something totally different, causes massive displacement, revolutions around the world, half the world is enslaved by communism for 70 years in reaction to it, and you kind of catch your breath, and then you have this thing called the digital revolution, which totally changes everything again. And so one of my main, maybe my overriding concern after the wage question, is how much change can people handle, actually, before they go crazy? And there's a lot of study in this. Robert Putnam at Harvard, who's hardly a right winger, has to, the bowling alone guy, has done a lot of really interesting study on this. Again, he's a liberal, but an honest one. And he's like, people, when they feel threatened, when things have changed too much, they get really angry and tribal, and they don't trust other people, and civic institutions collapse. And we're seeing this across the country. So there's a huge cost to changing everything up for the benefit of the few. And let me tie that to the first part of your question, which was, you said, in the South, there were raids on chicken plants, Tyson chicken plants, and the I, you know, INS or ICE or whatever we're calling it now comes in and says, you know, these people are here illegally without documentation. We're enforcing the law for once. And they couldn't find labor. Well, who is they? Well, they is the chicken plants. They is the employer, okay? And they couldn't find labor because they didn't want to pay market rates to Americans. So basically what they're saying is, even though we're in the United States, we're a company in the United States. And by the way, you can say this of Amazon and Walmart for sure and McDonald's and lots of other big corporations that the right has defended for many years, unfortunately, and now the left defends bizarrely. They benefit from all the institutions that make business possible, the rule of law, patents, like all the things that we have that other people don't have, okay? And yet they feel like paying the wages of Tegucigalpa. Because why wouldn't they? They're an employer. What bothers me is that no one ever calls them out on it. So like you often hear people say, well, who's going to pick the lettuce or whatever? And I'm not slagging lettuce pickers. I respect anybody who works with his hands in the sun, of course. But it's not about the picker. It's about his employer. So lettuce might cost, you know, four bucks a head. OK. Well, an iPhone costs 1000 because, like, actually things have costs because they have value because labor has value, duh. So I guess my question is, when did liberals all become libertarian economists who are lecturing me about the market and how one thing we can't do is get in the way of employers finding the cheapest possible labor? What? When did you start defending this? And the answer, of course, is that big companies figured out the game. 
And they're like, for a very small price, we can buy the allegiance of the Democratic Party. All we have to do is fund their nonprofits, which they do, but more importantly, make a series of totally hollow symbolic gestures, like here are some new bathrooms, I'm for Black Lives Matter, leave me alone. And they have totally convinced your average college student that they're the, the cutting edge of the progressive movement. And so you see this really weird thing that always blows my mind. You go into an Apple store, and shamefully, I own Apple products, and you'll walk in and there'll be like some highly educated, you know, kid with two degrees from impressive schools with a nose ring, standing in this kind of sad spare retail space wearing a matching uniform thinking he's part of the revolution. And I'm like, dude, you're working for the richest man in the world. Like, you're just a cog in a machine, you're a tool, actually. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm picking up, uh, uh, yeah, whatever. But I always think like the level of delusion that they've pulled off convincing the left, like don't criticize suicides at Foxconn factories because hey, you know, we got you on the dumb social issues that don't mean anything. And they fall for it. It's hilarious. Yeah. All right. So Tucker might be referring to uh, some corporate Democrats, et cetera, but anybody that watches the Young Turks knows we criticize big business plenty. Good and, for you. Yeah. Good for you. And so, so I mean, to use the same Apple example, uh, Apple makes a nice phone. I have one, uh, but that doesn't mean they should pay zero percent in taxes. And uh, and they exactly. They, Let me just amen. Yes. And so they evade taxes all the time. And if you want to uh, get together and enforce the law against big businesses, I'm right there with you. Okay, so that would be wonderful. That would be a nice change uh, from what we have in the Republican and Democratic Party today. But uh, one, one more thing on immigration, Tucker. So uh, you say demographic change is scary and, and uh, can be disconcerting. And I think that a lot of people don't see that. I don't see it. Uh, a lot of people in our audience don't see it. And so they wonder why folks are, are so scared. And so they, well, it, it, I. I literally don't know the answer to that. If you're saying crime, it's not crime. As we talked about before, I can give you more stats, 110% increase in immigration since 1980. Crime in the country has gone down 36%. Okay, and in the cities where you have the most undocumented immigrants, you have the least amount of crime. And, and, and in fact, studies have taken out other factors, including poverty, and they still see that undocumented immigrants lead to less crime, not higher crime, okay? So that's just a fact, that's a fact. So then I don't know what you're scared about. And, and, and Tucker, look, you're against, uh, as far as I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you call chain migration, what others call family migration. And so that is, as you acknowledge, the majority of legal migration. You're also against the lottery, and you do the math on that, and you've eliminated 85% of legal immigrants. But the country is massively, as you just stated, in favor of immigration. So if you're against undocumented immigrants and you're against legal immigrants and you cite fear and demography, can you see why people then would be concerned that it's racial and not based on crime or any other legitimate factor? I guess. I, I mean, in, in my case, I mean, I don't want to be defensive or anything. I don't think I really am very defensive, but I don't actually think that there's a real, I mean, look, I, appreci I sincerely appreciate this because I, I like an actual adult debate with a smart person about this, but I see that so rarely. Instead, I see people coming to the conversation convinced of their own virtue, and you don't actually, so it, it's a very simple way to write people off. I'm grateful for a chance to say in public what I really think about the effects of change. I think it's really disconcerting. And let me just make a point that is too rarely made. And that is that if you have a big diverse country like this, 320 million people, no majority of anything, right, in the country, and you're running it, or you're sort of in, try, seeking to influence people who run it, like you and I are, then you really have to think about, like, what are the most important questions? Do countries hang together just through inertia just because they do? No, they don't, actually. Countries tend to sort of break apart. They sp spin out into component parts. It's, you know, it's the story of history. And so what do you need in a country where nobody, no overwhelming majority has really anything in common. Well, what you need is a unifying culture, actually. A set of ideas. This is very obvious. This is not like, you know what I mean? This is, this is not applied physics, okay? It's super simple. It's true in your life. If you have, like, nothing in common with your spouse, does it make your marriage stronger? 
Like, we don't even speak the same language. We love each other more. For, yeah, please. It, it's not true of businesses or military. It's not true of anything because it's just not true. So it's not an insurmountable problem. I and mean, we've had this. This is not the first time we've thought about this in the history of the country. We thought about it a lot during the progressive era. What do we all have in common? And at the time we decided, well, we have our founding documents, the Bill of Rights. We have patriotism. We have English. And so those are the three. And I think it's sort of perfectly great set. Maybe you've got other ideas, OK? The point is not what are those things. The question is you must have those things. And if you don't, you're going to break apart. And maybe not now, but at some point you will, because why wouldn't you? So I would argue that the very idea of multiculturalism is insane as an organizing principle of a country. Not because I'm against, hold on, not, not, not because I'm against other cultures. I, my favorite thing is to travel and go to different cultures. I think they're super interesting, and a lot of them are great, maybe some better than ours. That's not the point I'm making. I'm saying as an organizing principle of your country, you need to have a common culture. Another word, another word for a collective set of beliefs. And I sincerely think, just based on being a lot of places around the world, that language is a key part of that. And that used to be, you keep referring to our earlier wave of big wave, the industrial wave of immigration that we had. The key thing that we demanded was fluency in English, key. Not because we were English chauvinist. English is not a racial category. It's a language shared by people of all kinds of different cultures. It's the language of Nigeria, OK? It's just a language. But language is the thing that holds more than anything else. And ask anybody who grew up in a multilingual country, how about a Canadian not that far away? What happens when you have competing languages? You have inherently division. This is not, slow down, this is not a Republican or Democrat or right wing or left wing issue. It's a total common sense issue that has been obscured for reasons I honestly don't understand, maybe by demagogues on both sides, but it doesn't matter, it's true. So if you're gonna have huge country changing levels of immigration, comma, and we do, comma, you need to make absolutely certain that everybody of every color and every religion is united in at least something beginning with language. Duh. So, Steve, so, sorry. What, what, yeah. So, I think this goes to the core of the issue, and I think this is a really interesting conversation. And, and so, look, on, on here, on English, uh, I, I might not be as doctrinarian as, as you think. I, I came here with not knowing any words. Uh, I knew three English words. When oh, I was how eight, old were you? I was eight years old, and I knew yes, no, and girl. Uh, that's it. And, uh, and they threw me into the deep uh, end, and, uh, and I did not do English as a second language, and you pick it up quickly. And so I, I, I get that we have to have a unifying language. India has a unifying language. It's also English. And so I think that there is a reasonable way to do that. I don't think that you have to throw everybody into the deep end, especially if they didn't come at the age of eight. And everybody has a different perspective, and there's a way of easing into that. But when we talk about culture, well, America's culture is not unicultural. It is, by definition, multicultural. That is our culture. So, I mean, look at all the things that we consider really American. Pizza, Italian, right? Uh, jazz, African American. And, uh, and I can go on and on, especially in the food category. So, and you famously, Tucker, the other day said that tacos are American and not Mexican. Yes, they are. That's the point. Yes. We brought them in. They're part of American culture now. That's the point. But Tucker, that's my point. But think about it, Tucker. That we brought all those things in, yes. and they are now part of our multicultural culture. Okay, so look, per, perhaps you know we're, we're having a debate over word definitions, or perhaps my verbosity has obscured what I'm really trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is, if you have a country, any country, particularly a huge and complex country like ours, where no, there is no other, there's no unifying fact, okay? Most countries have, settle down for a second, I'll, I'll be right there. <laughs> Most you know, do you know what I mean? Like that's, we, that is a potentially a vulnerability for us. I don't think it needs to be, but we need to address it thoughtfully. You have to have, of course, I'm not, I, I'm totally opposed to stamping out anybody's culture. You're telling anyone what to believe. I'm just saying the very most obvious thing, which you must have something in common with everyone else in your country, or why would you be a country? And if you don't think that, you haven't thought about it very much. That's all I'm saying. So this is a great, 
conversation. And what I love about it is we didn't mention Trump at all uh, during that. And so I think that's a good indicator that we're getting deeper into the issues here. So I, I want to just transition to the other big topic I wanted to touch on. And uh, in that last conversation, we talked about uh, the role of big business. And uh, Tucker, you've made the point before that you know, when we're over, so overly fixated on Trump, you, we miss out on some of the key underlying forces and policies that made a country you know, so angry. And, uh, and, and Cenk, this is a topic you've talked a lot about in terms of uh, the systemic corruption uh, that's been in government that people on the left and the right have been extremely angry about. Uh, Trump talked about drain the swamp. People on the left say unrig the system. How, how would you say we're doing on that right now and what do you think we would need to get to to actually uh, drain the swamp? And then I want to get your thoughts on that too, Tucker. Yeah, I, I want to get Tucker's thoughts too. I'm very curious about that. And I mean that very, very genuinely. Uh, so, uh, because he's, he's, he's more populist than I think that a lot of the left give him credit for. So, um, in, in terms of how we're doing, miserably, uh, it's about as bad as it can get. The corruption is rampant. Uh, it has taken over the system entirely. It's an absolute joke that c corporations are human beings, that they have speech rights. <laughs> and that somehow giving billions of dollars to politicians, whether it's Hillary Clinton or the Republican Party, is speaking to them? No, it's bribing them. That's what it is. <laughs> and so Donald Trump was and this is a very rare sentence for me to say, was smart uh, to uh, say drain the swamp. You know why? Because both Republican and Democratic and most importantly independent voters can't stand the corruption and they can't stand the swamp. And they're absolutely right about that. Now, of course the problem is Donald Trump is a pathological liar. And I, don't, and I don't know if Tucker can say that or, can, or will or will not, but he knows it. Everybody knows it. Um, and he, he lies every day, seven times a day, oftentimes t twice in a sentence. So uh, when he said he was going to drain the swamp, what did he do? He came in. Here, a great example. He said, all right, I'm going to negotiate Medicare uh, drug prices under Medicare. Uh, this is an outrage. Well, that's a very popular position. Uh, every sensible person agrees to that. And what did he do? He immediately came and said, just kidding. It turns out they're bribing me. No, I'm not going to negotiate prices. I'm going to do just the same thing as all other presidents have done. And now, mind you, Obama did the same thing. Now, Obama would have the excuse that, well, I was negotiating a complicated deal, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ran an ad saying that uh, what Bush had done was an outrage in not allowing us to negotiate drug prices, and then you struck the same exact deal, and so did Trump. Trump's a liar. He loves the corruption. He bathes in the corruption. So it's as bad as it could possibly be. And so my question to you, Tucker, is do you believe, do you believe in the 28th Amendment to get money out of politics. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll reframe the question. So I, I do want to get your thoughts on money in politics, but maybe the way I'll frame it is, you, know, you just wrote a book called Ship of Fools, and you talk about this self-indulgent culture of elites and the ruling class. So I want you to say more about specifically, you know, who are those folks, what are they doing, and then what types of reforms, maybe money in politics and or other things, do we need to start looking at? Well, let me just say, uh, to, the, to the Trump question, I would just say a couple things very fast. Um, one, you know, of all the criticisms leveled at Trump, the he's a compulsive liar thing, I, it, it, to me, it's the least sort of interesting. I mean, I actually think that the truth about Trump is he is what he seems to be. Like I've known a lot of politicians, and they really are two different people. The person on stage is, you know, children are a future. And then off stage is like, where are the hookers? You know, they're totally different. I mean, they are. And, and, and they are, almost all of them. Trump is kind of what we said we wanted. I mean, he really is. I've known him for 20 years, just coming in the media. He's pretty much exactly the same in person. I don't think, I mean, you, maybe you say, well, he's one-dimensional, and okay, whatever. Yeah, okay. 
sort of, if you watch one of his speeches, that's literally what he's like. There's no other agenda. So you either like that or you don't, or you have mixed feelings about it or whatever. I personally think it's maybe the least, it's the least interesting part of the moment we're going through. And I, your question was, it's like, we're missing a lot. I used to drink too much, like way too much. And every Sunday morning I'd wake up for a certain period of my life and I like, we have no memory of what happened the night before. And so I'd have to go sort of through forensically with my wife. Like, so we were at the restaurant, what happened then? And then like, how do we get home? And that's how all of America is going to feel when this is over. Do, do you know what I mean? It's like w the whole society is being transformed in the sort of easy thing to do and all the dumb cable chin tuggers do it. It's like, Trump, can you believe it? It's like, part of me is like, really, how outraged can you, can you sustain this outrage like indefinitely before you die of a stroke? Maybe, we'll see. But you're also kind of not covering the things that are really happening, which is American society is inverting and the middle class is dying and like nobody cares. Trump is a cover for everything on both sides. It's very, and I'm not, trust me, I'm not an intellectual, but even I am like, this is too dumb, even for me. As for the money and politics thing, yeah, I mean, look, it's very frustrating to confront the truth, which is people who have more money and power have more influence in a system in which influence is supposed to be spread equally among everyone. So it's inherently anti-democratic. I just have been in D.C. for so long, and I've seen all these different schemes to get money out of politics. I'm, I'm sort of temperamentally for all of them, I guess. But you bump up right away against this thing called speech. So can you really tell someone he's not allowed or she's not allowed to express political views during a certain period? It's like, actually, you can't. So it's a little more complicated, but I would say it's even more complicated because the real threat to the democracy, yeah, the campaign finance system is stupid. I, I mean, I, probably nothing you say I disagree with, but I don't think it's the real threat. The real threat is the massive concentrations of power outside government. So I grew up a conservative, you know, pretty, pretty doctrinaire, I guess sort of doctrinaire conservative, and I was taught my whole life that the real threat to liberty was the federal government because it was the most powerful entity, right? That's not at all the case. I mean, the beauty of the federal government is that it's so inefficient that it can't, it takes a long time to hurt you because they can't get their act together. Do, do you know what I mean? The people who run the post office are not in the end an existential threat to you because they're too lame, okay? Google is not lame. Google's technology so far, Google right now, for just give you one of a thousand examples, has 20,000 engineers working just on its search feature. Okay, these are people with advanced degrees make between two and 500 grand a year just on Google search. There are 20,000 of them. There has never been a technological entity or an entity of any kind as powerful as Google. Now I'm not saying Google is evil, though I think increasingly, I do think that they are. But even if they weren't, that is too much power in the hands of too few with no transparency whatsoever. At the heart of Google is the algorithm and nobody knows what it is. You don't need to be Ray Bradbury to think through what might happen if they decided to subvert democracy or to re-rank search results. What effect would that have on voting patterns? You reach the conclusion very quickly if you think about it, they'd be in control of your country. That is a huge threat to all of us. And it's not just Google, of course. It's many other tech platforms that basically control speech in effect. And so in the face of this, you have Republicans. Republicans are so easy to control. All you say is markets, and they're like, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Did I criticize the free market? I, you know what, Monsignor? Forgive me. And then Democrats are very easy to control, too. You're just like, look, we'll help you keep power. And they're like, oh, cool, all right. So what about everybody else? We stand on the brink of having a democracy that doesn't mean anything because in the end, our collective powers expressed in government has been totally outclassed by private power in the technology sector and no one is saying anything. Go ahead. Wow. So uh, who would have thought trust buster Tucker Carlson uh, from the progressive era? <laughs> So Teddy Roosevelt would be proud, um, and, and I appreciate that. I do, I'm, I'm being completely genuine. I think that this is a really interesting conversation, and in a lot of ways, far more interesting than the ones I've had in the past with conservatives at Politicon. Uh, we're having a real exchange of ideas here, okay? And, and, and so if you say there's too much power in, in corporate America, you are 100% right. 
uh, and in terms of, and that is why I was opposed to the um, uh, TPP, uh, and that's one of the few things that Trump has done that is good, maybe for the wrong reasons, but it's okay, I'll take it. Uh, we allowed corporations to write that pack. That's insane. And for a long time, we didn't even let our representatives see it. They're like, no, 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 the corporations are writing it. Piss off. Are you crazy? Are you insane? That's not how democracy is supposed to work. So I, I like that. But, but I'm curious. I want to delve into the, the issue of money out of politics a little bit more. So you seem concerned about corporate power. You said limiting people's right to speak would be problematic. I, I don't think so. I'll explain why, because I don't think it's really an unfair burden on, on the right to speak. But how about corporations? Uh, do you think corporations should have the right to spend unlimited money in politics? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not that, yeah, no, I guess, yes, no, I don't know. I mean, to be totally honest with you, oh, boo, boo, boo. You're winning me over, keep booing. Um, you know, I know that this spins up the left more than anything, and they're like, corporations aren't people or whatever. Yeah, okay, I guess I agree. But I would just work backward and say, I don't think the problem, so this, it's the straightforward stuff that never scares me. And that's why Trump doesn't really rattle my cage. I'm against, actually, I'm not a populist, to be honest with you. I think populism is a symptom that the people in charge have really screwed up, and, and it's a warning sign that it's going to get crazier unless we fix the underlying problem. So I'm not actually a populist. I acknowledge that every society is hierarchical, hierarchical and always will be. So I, I'm not that afraid of Trump because I think he's so straightforward, and, I, and I'm not that afraid, actually, of like conventional political advertising because I'm not afraid of people talking about what they think or disseminating a message or whatever. What I'm really afraid of is things happening beneath accountability and beneath the sight of the public, things happening in secret, both because I think that's inherently subversive, but also because it shakes people's faith that the system is on the level. And, and our system is basically faith-based. The only reason it's a stable country is because of our democracy. So people get super frustrated, right? But in the end, as we're all taught as children growing up here, don't burn the Bastille or storm the police. You know, don't go crazy, actually. Just vote. And that has, been a, that has been the pressure relief valve that has kept the country stable. If all of a sudden people come to believe the system is rigged, then you're toast. And, and the reason I'm kind of not giving you a straight answer on the corporate stuff is because I am deeply, more than anything, my, my er concern, my main concern right now is speech. And I think a lot of the reforms, and you've seen this with the social media platforms, a lot of the reforms in response to the 2016 election have in fact been attempts to squelch speech. And so I'm worried about campaign finance reform. I mean, I'm not worried about it, I'm for it, I guess, but I just, I'm hyper vigilant about the people writing the laws, writing them in such a way that any American won't have the right to express his or her political views. That, we have to walk backward from that, okay? So like whenever you're trying to figure out like what's the wise course, you need to keep in your mind's eye, in the crosshairs, what is the goal? Like what is the one thing that we can never sacrifice? Okay, we're not throwing out of the lifeboat. And it has to be speech, because that's the foundation of everything. You have no power if they can control what you say. Because controlling what you say is tantamount to controlling what you think. And so we need to be totally paranoid about that. In fact, more paranoid than ever, because it turned out the people we relied upon to fight that fight for us, folks like the ACLU, have completely gone over to the other side. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, actually, some speech, some speech is so horrendous that, like, decent people won't allow it. And my first thought was, well, who are the decent people exactly, and what are the criteria they're using to determine what's acceptable or not? Like, this whole road is not a road we ever even want to venture on. You don't get to decide what I think, period. There's no circumstance under which you can say what I'm allowed to think, period. And all of a sudden, you have people being like, well, but what if it's really heinous? I don't care. You don't get to define heinousness, pal. Only I can define it. And you can't stop me. And that's what makes this a unique country in the world. It's not a market economy. It's not a justice system. It's not an interstate highway system. It's speech. We're the only country that has it. And we're on the, the cusp of getting rid of it. So 
I actually feel just as fervently about speech, and, and I want to pose a question back to you in a second. Uh, but when you ask about what is the goal, uh, for me, the number one goal right now is to reclaim our democracy. Yes. And so right now, what we have is an oligarchy uh, of the few that have bought almost all of our politicians. And so can we limit, can we have some reasonable limitations on speech? Well, of course, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And every other developed nation does not allow the rampant legalized bribery that we allow. So uh, when you say, well, I mean, I don't mind political ads, well, it depends, doesn't it? Because it is a giant, giant megaphone, and it can drown out all other speech. So that's why I am vigilant about it. So I'll give you an example that I think most of the room can relate to. Washington posted a, a good story about how the Clintons had gotten raised $3 billion over their careers, OK? They raised it through their foundation, through campaign donations, and actually, right into their pockets, okay? Now, people did not give the Clintons $3 billion for their health. They just didn't. They did it to bribe them, okay? And what did the, and, and, and corporations don't give you money out of the goodness of their heart for, or for charity, they do it for return on investment. And so, and the first time they give to a politician, it's an experiment. The second time they give to a politician, it was a good investment. And that unfortunately describes most of our politicians. So what did the Clintons buy with that $3 billion? They bought a giant megaphone. And yes, it, Donald Trump overcame it because he got $5 billion in free media in the election cycle. $5 billion, okay? But who did not overcome that megaphone? Every other Democratic contender, they were crushed by that microphone. And the reality is the Clintons shut out the speech of all other people with the bribes that they received. And I cannot abide by it. I cannot abide by it. We need our democracy back. So, and I, and I don't want you to get the wrong idea that I'm just picking on Democrats. Obviously, the Republican Party is on the national level is about 99.9 percent .9 corrupt. They take the money, they do their bidding. They're the most corrupt party in in, in American history. So, uh, but on the issue of speech, so there can be reasonable regulations. Every other developed country does it. But Tucker, for a guy who's as vigilant about protecting speech, I am curious, and again, this is genuine, why you don't support the free speech rights of Colin Kaepernick? <laughs> That's pretty really funny. You know, I was, just, I was just worrying if, like, Nike Pitchman had enough power in our society. Um, I think he's okay. I'm, I've never challenged his speech rights. I mean, ever. I've never challenged anybody's speech rights. I mean, you, there's not a wacko I wouldn't defend on speech grounds. And I have defended a lot of crazy people on speech grounds, including Colin Kaepernick, who I think is a, a buffoon. Whatever. I don't think it's that. It, my, my, problem, my problem with Kaepernick relates back to what I was saying earlier about what unites us in our, I mean, it's just, it's inherently, to borrow a term from the academic left, problematic to have a ruling class that hates the country it rules. And so you can't actually, you're, you really have to sort of buy into all the, the hokey patriotic stuff if you're in charge, almost by definition. You really have to. You gotta put your hand over your heart and recite the Pledge of Allegiance and the Star Spangled or, or think of a new set of, of whatever, of, of symbols to honor. If you don't like those, make up new ones. But you have to have those things or else you can't lead because you can't lead people you don't care about, actually. Empathy is a prerequisite for leadership. If you don't love your children, they will wind up in rehab. If, you don't, if you're an officer and don't care about the safety of your men, they will die. If you're an employer and you really don't care about your employees, like your company will fail. I'm not making a touchy-feely point, I'm making a practical one. We, the people who run the country, who derive the greatest benefit, I'm not simply talking about a political class, I'm talking about a finance class, to name one among a couple examples, the, the tech oligarchs. These are people who have deep contempt for the population of the country. And I'm not even making a moral judgment about that. Like, lots of people have ideas and attitudes I hate, but I'm just saying it doesn't work. 
you will run the country into the ground unless you really care, and they really don't. And the Kaepernick thing is just like so perfect, it's so cynical. If you wanna have a conversation about police brutality, I used to be a police reporter. I think it's a super interesting topic. I think anyone with power, including cops, can misuse it. That's the worst case scenario. I'm totally opposed to it, okay? But let's be honest, this is like, this is a sideshow, okay? That makes a certain kind of person feel virtuous for supporting, it's not about speech. Again, I would never, I would never challenge his speech rights in a million freaking years. But, but see, Tucker, and I'm giving you the perspective of other folks here, which is that for you it seems like a sideshow, but for African Americans who are being jailed and killed disproportionately, it is not. It's not a, it's not a curiosity. So, for example, 60... I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm not, I just want to be totally clear because I can sometimes talk too fast to explain myself. I'm not saying, that's why I said I was a police reporter. I think that people abuse their power, cops included. I don't think the issue is a sideshow. I'm just saying like this rich guy pretending to speak for all African Americans, like spare me, you know what I mean? No, I don't, and I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. I get, I get what you're saying, but, but who, who is going to speak for them? Is, this, is, the media going to, is the media going to pay attention to a, guy, a middle class guy? to a poor guy, they, they pay no attention whatsoever. And so people object to the way that Colin Kaepernick did it. Well, oh my God, he did it in the middle, in the middle of the National Anthem. Why did he do it in the middle of the National Anthem? To get your attention. And the reality is that's the only thing that works when a rich guy who's a famous athlete does something in the middle of something that you're paying attention to. And, what, and so now we should have that conversation about police brutality against African Americans. Perfectly done by Colin Kaepernick. But it, I mean, that's sort of a fair point in that there are symbolic figures who call attention to an important issue who haven't mastered the tales. I, mean, I, kind of, I, get, I get that. I mean, I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't think that Rosa Parks was like an expert on the Civil Rights Act, but that doesn't make her less powerful a symbol or less important a figure in American history. So I think that's a fair point. I guess what I'm saying is we haven't had that conversation about police brutality and race at all. Because everyone's so freaking terrified to say anything that no one could talk about anything. You have to sort of just nod and be like, oh yeah, whatever the piety of the day is, I'm totally on board. Mr. Commissario, completely, I don't disagree in any way. I'm not gonna ask any questions because I'd be disobedient, you will punish me. It's like we don't have real conversations because people are terrified they're going to be punished if they have the conversation. So the first question I would ask is a database question which shouldn't scare any of us. The facts should never scare us. And because we live in a large industrialized society that's most sophisticated in human history, we have a ton of data on everything. How many kids hurt on seesaws last year? It's knowable. How many people, you know, do you die younger from smoking menthol cigarettes than unfiltered? We know that. There's nothing we don't know, okay? So numbers don't tell the whole story, obviously, but they're a starting point for real conversation. So how common is this? Are white officers more likely to fatally shoot black suspects than black officers are? I don't know. Those are, if you even say that, it's like, I don't wanna know. Stop with that spooky science stuff. I've made up my mind. The only way that you solve a problem is by honestly talking about it with the sum total of what you know about it, and that's exactly what we cannot do because the purpose is not to fix the problem. It's for some people to feel like good people as opposed to all of them, and others to maintain their control over the population. So if we were having like a vigorous debate like, oh my gosh, you know, John Jay College of Criminology has actually studied this a lot, and here's what they found, and here's the three things we should do to fix it. Dude, I'm for that. That's the opposite of what we're having. We've got Nike ads. That won't fix it. So, we amazingly have run out of time. That hour just flew by. We're out of time total? Yeah, we're already over time. Dude, I'm just going. <laughs> I know, we're just getting started. I mean, first of all, that was me, so fun. Thank yeah, you. I mean, let me ask you all a question. Where else do you get to see this kind of conversation? Seriously. And I, again, want to thank Politicon for convening this type of discussion. Uh, and the last thing I'll just mention before you all head out, we've talked a lot about corruption. The most important thing we can do to get rid of that corruption is to vote in this midterm election and to tell your elected leaders that you care about this issue. So I want to thank our panelists, Tucker Carlson, Cenk Uger, for a great discussion. Thank you, Politicon. Thank you, all of you. Make sure you go home safely and go vote this November. Thank you very much.